Welcome to Jurassic Park. <laughs> E a floresta em si é como se fosse o pulmão de todo o planeta, entendeu? Cada vez que você vai desmatando mais, cada vez ele vai trabalhando mais com força. Hey guys, welcome to Manaus. I just joined up with this with this group. We're with uh, Dr. Thomas Lovejoy and friends. This is Sean. Hi, camera. This is Thomas Lovejoy. He first started research in Brazil in 1965, coined the term biological diversity in case you've ever used that in a conversation before, and he was largely responsible for introducing the scientific community to deforestation happening in the Amazon during the 1980s. Well, I first set foot in the Amazon in June of 1965. What was different back then? When we just came up the There was much more forest. <laughs> He also founded a research reserve north of Manaus called the Biological Dynamics of Forest Fragments Project. Dr. Lovejoy now leads trips every year to explain why the Amazon is so important and why this is one of the most significant research sites in the rainforest. Uh, almost 4 a.m. today. Bom dia. In order to get to this reserve, we have to drive along a highway called the BR-174. There are many campsites spread throughout the reserve, many hammocks filled with curious scientists from around the world, but we'll be headed 41 kilometers down an extremely rough dirt road to a little paradise called Camp 41. <laughs> Camp 41. The second I got here, an ant bit me in the back of the knee. Did it actually? Yes, 100%. <laughs> oh, baby, they don't call him Lovejoy for nothing, so. <laughs> A couple small fish just swimming around my legs. I know they are not piranhas. Big bushy tail that hangs down way up, way up high where the sun the, 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 These are bearded sake monkeys. They're checking us out. Bearded sake monkeys, come on, come right up. This research project is approved by INPA, the National Institute of Amazonian Research, in 1979. And basically, the Brazilian government was subsidizing and incentivizing cattle ranches in this area. When cattle ranchers would clear land, the idea was to assess how biodiversity levels were maintained in various sizes of fragmented forest. The majority of those cattle ranches have since failed, and a lot of those original plots of deforestation have been abandoned and are now growing back as second growth. The fragment that we're going to go visit was the very first one to be isolated in 1979. At that moment, if you drove in, all you would see just wall to wall destroyed forest around this 10 hectare fragment. So the way they work in taking down the forest is they go through and they take down the saplings and then they go back and take down the really big trees. And as soon as the understory is eliminated that way, it created a refugee effect. And our capture rate of birds in the soon to be completely isolated fragment jumped way up. And then of course it went down. Uh, so we hadn't even anticipated the refugee effect. This is the soil type in this part of the Amazon just a kind of a yellow clay and it's not very rich in nutrients in fact it's very poor in nutrients and yet this exuberant forest grows on it 
So this is Mario Kohnhoft. He started as an intern of Thomas Lovejoy's at this research reserve and ended up spending the rest of his career in Brazil, living in Manaus and working for the National Institute of Amazonian Research as an ornithologist, meaning a bird expert. So we've got howler monkeys in this reserve. Um, and we had lost howler monkeys, actually. There was, this, there was this troop that was just isolated here going, what the hell do we do now? And somebody got lucky, and as they were walking into the reserve, they saw a howler monkey running across this sort of scrubby pasture, which they never do. I mean, very unlikely to come to the ground, so you've got to be under a lot of stress. But and when we stepped into the reserve here, I could smell howler monkey poop. So there's some howler monkeys that have recolonized, apparently, this reserve. When the second growth comes up, some things will recolonize, but they don't last very long. The overall effect is still of degradation and loss of species diversity. Leading up to this research project, data on forest fragments was collected only after a forest was cleared. This reserve was the first project in the Amazon with the goal of filling those gaps by studying the impacts on forest fragments while the forest was being cut down. Research has been ongoing for 40 years, and it's the longest running data set on fragmentation in the tropical rainforests. One of the questions that was really challenging to answer without having good data was, is it better to have lots of small reserves or fewer larger ones? Studies at this reserve have confidently demonstrated a need to create large protected areas within the Amazon. The really, really interesting thing is as soon as we started this project, Every protected area created, created in Brazil was very large. And it's almost like we could have been drinking beer out in the forest and we would have affected public policy. This is a jabuti, a kind of land tortoise that's really common in the Amazon. All right, first taste of the tambuki. All right. As Thomas was explaining with the tambuki, it's a type of fish that actually eats nuts. They eat palm fruits and everything. So the teeth of the fish actually look like humans, like human teeth. And it is one of the most succulent fish, period. It looks Because amazing. they build up these fat supplies mm. during the high water months and then they live off them in the rest. Mm. <laughs> the best meal that we had on this trip wasn't at the bougie restaurant in Manaus, but here in the Amazon, in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. That actually was the world's smallest lizard? Yes, it was, the world's smallest lizard. It's in the gecko family, and it's got a scientific name that is known, but forgotten by yours truly. It's something like <laughs> called... Salamandrus amazonicus, world's smallest <laughs> lizardus. You were the first one to see it? I saw it, I saw it dancing in, in a puddle of water. And that's a trip, right? Something you think is insignificant ends up being the world something is something. So we are now making our ascent up the observatory tower. This is gonna be a good workout. Wait, how many times have you done this, Thomas? I can't count. <laughs> wow, look how beautiful that is. But one of the things to notice as you start looking around, just keep in mind that this is the most biodiverse forest on the planet. So Matias, capture some of that hydrological cycle, the moisture coming out, because it'll probably be gone in half an hour. All right, let's do it. The Atlantic Ocean, carrying humidity from the ocean, dumps the first rains over the rainforest. The forest itself produces all this evapotranspiration or humidity clouds. Those build up and then as, as they're getting swept further west, dump again and three, four, or five times until they get to the Andes, all this rain is recycled. 
all coming off the Atlantic Ocean, basically. And there's this rain shadow effect, as it's called, in some of the driest deserts in the world. The Atacama Desert, just across the Andes, is all the water's been sucked out of the out of the atmosphere by the mountains. The Amazon moisture contributes to every country in South America, except for Chile. Really? Because Chile starts, you know, at the peak of the Andes, so uh -huh. it's just rain shadow. Yeah. experience the Amazon rainforest for the first time with this group was incredible. I look out and I see unbroken rainforest all the way to Suriname and French Guiana. It feels endless, like it's untouchable. And yet here I'm confronted with the reality that deforestation rates are increasing. Already one-fifth of the Amazon has been deforested. The main concern is clearing rainforest to the point that the Amazon can't recycle enough of its own rainfall. The result could be a cascading effect as rainforest converts into dry savanna. Thomas Lovejoy and climate scientist Carlos Nobre have commented that increasing long dry seasons may be evidence that the tipping point is not theoretical anymore, it's happening already. Illegal occupation of land, illegal deforestation, mining, timber extraction, fires, and land use change for crops and cattle are some of the factors that may threaten the existence of the Amazon in the future. What they show is that increasing expansion is putting increasing pressure on ecosystems that give valuable benefits to people living within it and surrounding it. Many of the croplands and cattle ranches are dependent on the rainfall from the Amazon. Cutting it down, could be like sawing off the very branch you're standing on. 